Hi, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, it is with really, really great uh, pleasure that I would like to introduce um, Dave Chickie, the award-winning publisher, designer, and editorial director of Radius Books. Um, he uh, has also been a curator, director, and designer in the art world for over 20 years. And as the grad book uh, crunch approaches, I thought it would be important to bring David to inspire all of you to think of the book as an art, as a form in itself or end in itself. And um, David's designed books that are among my favorites. So this is just really, really special to have you here. And I think it's gonna be a really important visit for all of us. So David. Thank you, Liz. Um, happy to be here and it's, it's uh, nice to get away from Santa Fe for a couple of days and be somewhere cold and snowy that's colder and snowier than Santa Fe. Um, I'm going to do a pretty informal talk and give you guys a sense of the publishing company Radius, how we formed Radius and how it was structured. Um, just a little bit of an overview of our philosophy and then, and then I'm going to take you through some individual projects, um, talking about how we started the project with the artists that we worked with, how that project evolved and sort of then made its way into a book form. Um, but since it's kind of a small audience, I'm really comfortable if you guys want to interrupt me and you have questions, just raise your hand. I'm happy to sort of make this a slightly more informal and collaborative talk if you want it to be. So feel free. If, that, if not, we can, when I'm finished going through all the projects, we'll have time for some questions and answers as well. So um, I started Radius uh, in 2007. Um, it was a response in many ways to sort of the state of what was happening in art publishing. Uh, my background is really mostly from the art world. Um, I was both, um, well, my, my undergrad work was an art history major. My grad work was as a painting major. So my, my design background is actually completely self-taught. Um, I became obsessed with typography and began a process of sort of investigating typography and designing things, and that led to a design office. Um, our design office became known mainly for designing books about art. Um, but one of the things that happened as a designer designing books about art is that a lot of mainstream publishers would push these projects more and more towards mainstream sales, um, kind of in some cases sort of dumbing down the design and taking the design farther away from what I thought the artist's vision was and more into the realm of what they thought might sell better. And it was sort of in that environment that we started having conversations about um, what it would mean to start a publishing company that was really beginning from the perspective of the book as the primary part of that structure. Um, this is a quote that I happen to like a lot from Ralph Prenz. He's a photo historian that says, an art book is an autonomous art form comparable with a piece of sculpture, a play, or a film. The images lose their own photographic character as things in themselves and become parts translated into printing ink of a dramatic event called a book. And I think there is something inherently possible in a book form um, in and of itself as an object that maybe was getting lost in the general concept of what it meant to publish books, where you have publishers that are just saying, okay, I'm gonna put a plate on the right-hand page with a caption on the left-hand page, and we're just gonna disseminate this work so that it was this disposable way of thinking about it. And part of Radius's philosophy was to think about how do we kind of rethink that strategy a little bit? So this was first and foremost about the artist and the artist's work being sort of the primary motivating factor for how the project was conceived and thought of. Instead of thinking about the project from the standpoint of how can we market this the best or how can we sell this project the best, how does a book become sort of evolved from the artist vision and whether that artist is a photographer or a sculptor or a painter, um, Radius actually publishes a, a broad selection of art, about only about half of what we publish is photography related, about the other half is, um, is art of other media. Um, so that was sort of one of our driving 
principles. Um, another one was to think about the book as an object, like I was talking about, just more as an overall concept of how you can think about this three-dimensional thing that people hold in their hands. Um, I think there are some really, really great and rare opportunities with books for people to have an intimate experience where they can hold it, feel it, experience it, and it sort of can translate into something that's m you know, more engaged and involved than just you know, a, a simple book. One of the more radical ways in which Radius is structured is that we also structured the institution as a nonprofit. So sort of divorcing Radius from this traditional model of trying to make money, um, but also um, recognizing the fact that books like this have a place, they have, they have a role to fill, an artistic role to fill, but they aren't, they aren't in today's economy huge money makers. They're not, you know, they, they do incredible things for artists, they do incredible things for the institutions. There's a wide audience out there that actually wants to own these objects, but not in the levels of numbers like Harry Potter. You know, it's not like we're gonna be selling thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of these books. They still offer something really great, but by making the institution a nonprofit, we sort of got pulled away from that whole desire or need to make um, a, a lots of money on each project. And then tied into that, it was always very important to me. Um, I grew up with a relationship with libraries. Um, and as things evolved in the design offices, and I met with more and more publishers, more and more publishers would complain about loss of sales to libraries. Because it used to be 20 years ago that libraries across this country would buy almost any art book that was published by a significant publisher. It would automatically be purchased by as many as 800 to 1500 libraries across the country. And publishers could guarantee that they would sell enough copies of the book by just publishing. They knew that they would sell enough copies to these libraries. And what happened over time is that the library stopped buying the books and publishers would complain about that from the perspective of loss of sales. But part of m my concern was that where did the law, wh where did the stop buying come from? Was it because libraries didn't want the book or because there wasn't an audience for the book or was it because libraries were having their budgets cut? And, and the reality, of course, is very complex, but in a lot of situations, it was because the libraries really just didn't have the money to buy these kinds of books anymore. And what we discovered when we started Radius, we started building back a network where we, we now donate 300 to 500 copies of every book we publish to a network of libraries and institutions across the country. And there are now 700, more than 700 institutions representing all 50 states that want the books that we publish. And so it sort of reopens that network of people that are asking for and engaged with and want the things that we're making. So I think part of it is not only just the audience of the people that, you know, frankly, you look at this and you think, okay, this is going to the audience of the people who are wealthy enough to buy a 50, 60, $70 book, but that's not really getting at the heart of maybe trying to get this book out to a broader audience to that where I like the idea that there are underserved libraries and there are, you know, 12 year olds that are going in and finding some of these books and not being able to see them in any other place. So that also became a big part of our mission. Um, and then that sort of led to this um, philosophy of thinking, how do we publish and what do we publish? Um, I'm not gonna talk specifically a lot about what we publish. We, we do find that we're driven by the projects that we find engaging, interesting on a personal level. I only have a couple of guidelines that I try to follow every year. One of which is, which I just mentioned, is that there's a balance between photography and art of other media. The other thing is that I feel very strongly about having a balance of the numbers of men and women that we publish. Um, I, I think you'll find in the publishing industry, as well as a lot of others, that there's a predominance of men who are published over women. Um, I just got the recent Steidl catalog and there's 35 new titles on Steidl's list and there's one book in the entire list that has a woman artist. I just don't believe that that's representative of what's happening. And so from the beginning, Radius has always published about 50-50 split between men and women. Um, but aside from that, we publish a really wide variety and the books have, and I hope and I try to make them have as much of the personality of the work that we're publishing as any kind of driving identity to directed towards Radius. Um, I think Ironically, we have sort of have developed this identity where people think that our books have a certain kind of feel to them, but I think that's really more because we're trying to let the art drive the design of the project more than we're driving it in some sort of branding kind of concept. So that's part of the point of 
of that I think I'm going to kind of repeat over and over again about talking about these projects and the design of these projects. It's sort of a driving philosophy. Um, we also have an exhibition space in Santa Fe, um, and so we have talks and lectures, and we invite some of the artists that we publish to have exhibits, and um, also we're sort of at the same time that we're building a donation program, building an education program that um, allows people to engage, because in Santa Fe and in other places, a lot of the people that we publish don't really necessarily have a voice or an audience. And so we do these in Santa Fe, but we also do them in other places all over the world, which has become a part of our mission as well. So I'm going to start um, talking through these projects. This is, a, this is a book that was actually from our very first list in 2007. Um, Mark Klett is um, a fairly well-known photographer. Um, but this project was a project that he had actually submitted to, I think, 14 publishers um, by the time he brought it to me, and all of them had rejected the project. Um, it, it became a little ironic because this project, once we published it, sold out in about three months, um, and copies of this book have been sort of very hotly in demand ever since. So it's a really interesting, it was sort of a very early lesson for me to think about um, even though this is, a, this is a book that a traditional publisher thought wasn't going to reach an audience, it actually had something engaging in a way, you know, something engaging and interesting to say. Um, he came to me in this instance with a portfolio of prints. Um, one of the things, a, a, I remember having conversations with Mark at the time he brought these to me. He brought a portfolio of prints, and the prints were actually quite small. Um, maybe eight by ten, and um, this book is 14 inches tall, so it's a big book by book standards, and I think one of the things we realized really quickly in the process is we started printing images um, in, you know, off-the-color printer in sort of a process of trying to figure out how big to make the book, and I remember in the studio printing the the images at like you know 10 inches tall, 11 inches tall, 12 inches tall, 13 inches tall, 14 inches tall to really get a sense of how they f how they worked. And 14 inches is about the maximum. In fact, it's 14.72 inches is the maximum that you can bind a book mechanically, and not pay to hand bind copy of of the book. So this is sort of pushing the envelope of what's technically available from uh, a mass distribution binding perspective. Um, but these images carry a lot more power at that size, and it sort of, I think it, 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 it helped in terms of people understanding and looking at the book to see the book at a bigger scale. Um, this was also very much, from a radius perspective, part of thinking about alternative ways of binding books, and it's a little hard to see in this, in this photograph, but um, this book is um, what's called a chop binding, um, and it's a binding that we essentially created for this book, um, where the, the, the spine side of the book has no board in the spine, like a typical three, you know, hardbound book would have. Um, so it's sort of a hybrid between a softbound and a hardbound book. And the book actually then goes into the guillotine to get trimmed, and all, all three, top, bottom, and the outside right edge, get chopped at the same time. So it leaves, leaves the raw exposed cardboard on the edge. And there's something aesthetically that really fits with the rawness of the imagery. These are all photographs of saguaro cactuses that Mark took in the Sonora Desert starting in like 1977 um, up until the time we published the book in 2007. So it was like a 30-year body of work. I think there's about 100 images in the book. It's a really pretty straightforward, you know, sequence of all of these images, but the, but the images sort of begin to play this anthropologic, you know, they become this sort of desert landscape populated with these people, cactuses. Um, one of the next books that we did was a book with Fried Lee Friedlander. Um, <coughs> Lee, um, who many of you may know, um, about the time that we started working on this book, Lee had a retrospective at MoMA, and um, probably a, a quarter to a third of that exhibit was vitrines of books. Um, so books have been a very critical part of his process and in his, of his thinking. 
Um, we became engaged in this project because it was images of New Mexico, and he has a long history of coming out to New Mexico. Obviously, we're based in New Mexico, so there was sort of a rational overlap. Um, but Lee also had a very conservative approach to the way that he thought about his books. He has this very, um, a lot of the books are really colorful on the outside, but text-driven covers, as well as simple sort of insides, and he also had worked with the same printer in the United States to print almost all of his books. Uh, this was the 33rd book that he had published when we did this book. Um, so it was really interesting to work with an artist who had such a strong concept. And this also has a raw board binding, and the binding, um, when the book is open, lays open and completely flat. And part of what I really liked about this binding was that it allowed the pages of the book to lay really flat and clean, and so you have a real kind of opportunity to see the book and the construction of the book easily, um, which really seemed to work really well with the process. Um, and Can you talk a little bit about um, the essays in the book and the selection of the writers? Sure. Um, in, um, you want me to go back to the first book or just? Just in general. Just, just, a, just the choices from the book. You know, I think, um, Text is a really important component, I think, of these books. I've always thought of them as being a really critical aspect to books. Um, and we think a lot about what might be interesting text components. Um, I think as Radius has evolved, one of the things that's happened for me is that I've, um, I've become more and more interested with alternative ways of thinking about text in art books. Um, so we have, in recent years, commissioned all kinds of different people aside from writers that have relationships to the subject matter, you know, curators or, and we still work with people like that, but I'm also really interested in short story writers or scientists or philosophers. Um, the text in um, Mark Klett's book um, was written by uh, essentially a scientist who has a long history of the history of saguaro cactuses. And so it was sort of interesting to get his take on their place in the desert and the sort of evolution of what's happening uh, ecologically in the desert, and so it kind of adds a layer to that. Um, the, this is, is a very short uh, piece about um, Lee's time in New Mexico, and it was written by the curator at the Museum of New Mexico, so it was a very straightforward, this is where he came, this is where he photographed, this is where these images come from. Um, this is a... Um, a book, I, I think it was the third year of Radius, that we were approached by Harvard. Harvard has, um, it gives a prize every year called the um, Gardner Prize in Photography, and they, they select um, an, a photographer working mainly in a documentary vein, and they are awarded a grant to do a specific project, and then the project after a year culminates in a book and um, an exhibition at the Gardner Museum. And um, so we've been publishing a book with them every year. And this one um, it was a project with uh, a photographer um, based in Delhi um, named Dianita Singh. And Dianita had spent a year taking photographs digitally and in color when before pretty much everything she had done had been in black and white and in film. So it was this sort of new evolution for her. And so I went to, to Delhi to sit and to spend some time with her and to think about the process. Um, and she had all these, when I arrived, she had all of these images that she had sort of began to think about and began to kind of conceive of how they could be in a book. And um, she had laid out these sequences of images on the couch in her studio. <laughs> and, um, and she described them as stories. And each, basically each line that you see there, she described as a story. And so the book eventually led to um, being inspired by um, the short story collections of Italo Calvino from the 70s. And so the design of this book, the, the size of it is the size of those books. Um, the, the, the typography is influenced by those books. Um, and, and essentially we designed a book that is a collection of short stories. And so the books are, I mean, the, the, the book is subdivided into chapters. Each chapter has a title and then it is a purely visual short, short story that tells the story of, of each one of these sequences of images. And it turns out that we ended up going back and weaving both color and black and white images together. Some of the chapters 
um, have toned backgrounds. So there's definitely this play in terms of like the form of the book and the structure of the book in trying to create each one of these having their sort of individual character. Um, and in this case, the text um, is by um, Avik Sen, who's an Indian writer who had actually written pretty extensively um, photo criticism about uh, different strains of photography and um, had right before we published this book, and the reason she wanted to work with him, won um, a criticism prize um, for writing photo criticism. When we started talking about this book and the structure of the book and the way that the book was formed, he ended up writing a section, a selection of stories. So he wrote a little group of short stories as well that sort of weave in and out. And some of the characters in the stories are Dianita, and he appears in some of the images that she did of her visual short story. So there's sort of this play that happened between the two of them. In that case, she did. Well, she invited him. She wrote to me a couple of weeks before I got to India, and she said, I'm thinking about working with Avik Sen. What do you think? And it, it was just by complete coincidence that I had met him like a month before that, and I actually really liked his writing. And so I said, oh, I think that would be really great. If he's around, that would be wonderful. We could meet. Um, uh, Dianita is um, really remarkable and great, but she's also just like, super strong and really, you know, so like by the time I got there, she was like, Avik's writing for us. This is the way it's going to be, you know, and it was just sort of this, oh, okay, this will work. I mean, it, it was great, but it wasn't, it just sort of, so she did kind of bring him to the table in a way that was like demonstrative, but it didn't start that way. <laughs> um, this is, um, you know, not, a, this is not a photography book. I told Liz I would focus mostly on photography books, but I brought, I brought images as a book um, simply because I think it's a way to think about um, conceiving a cover of a book that comes from the way the work is made. Um, so there's probably a lot to talk about in terms of the content of this book, um, but um, this is a, a book on the work of a painter named Ed Moses. Ed is, at this point, 89, um, still living, still working in L.A., uh, has a long history of making really remarkable work. Um, when we did this project about five years ago, um, Ed, um, you know, I went to the studio to spend time with Ed, and Ed paints outside on the, basically, the driveway behind the studio. Um, and he has this sort of crazy way of working and spraying and pouring and playing with materials that he um, throws all over the canvas of his work. And so one of the things that um, I started thinking about was that he does these dripped, poured canvases that I think are really remarkable, but he allows a lot of the canvas to sort of come through and the surface of the paint sort of builds up on top of it. Um, so um, the paintings have this very poured, kind of dripped kind of quality to them. Um, for the cover, um, it may be hard to see in that image, but the cover of the book, so the white, what looks white in that image, the cover of the book, is a photograph of the raw canvas that he paints on. So it's a reproduction of the canvas. And then that jacket is made from a material called soft acetate. So it's this soft, clear, plastic material that kind of has a relationship to the kind of paint that he works with. And we silk screened on top of the surface of that acetate a detail from one of the paintings so that, so that the cover of the book actually has kind of a sense of depth and materiality that's very much like his paintings um, so that you have some kind of sense of the work before you actually even open the book. And in that case, um, I didn't bring images of it, but this book is here, I think, um, and we can look at it. Um, it we ended up Ed, we did an interview with Ed, and Ed at the time was 84 years old, and we thought we would reproduce the interview, and he's great talking about his work. He's remarkable. Um, but we started the interview the first time I went out to see him and spent two or three hours recording this interview, and it wasn't particularly coherent. Um, he kind of jumped around all over the place, and so I went back, you know, after this happened, I called him back and I said, Ed, you know, I don't know that that really worked. Maybe we need to do an essay. And he talked about how much he hated every essay that had ever been written about his work. So we were really loath to commission somebody to write something because we didn't know if he would like what we ended up doing. And 
he ended up telling me that he didn't like anything that had ever been written on him because it always had a beginning and an end. <laughs> and um, what I began to understand is that Ed's process is so sort of like fractured that he couldn't deal with the idea of something that was really structured. He didn't like that concept. So we actually ended up inviting, I think, 20 different people that had relationships with Ed, artists that he had worked with, curators that he had worked with, writers that he had worked with, and we asked all of them to write five questions for him. And then I took all five of those, all of those questions, and sat with him and asked them in completely random order and didn't tell him who had asked them. And we recorded his answers to those questions. And so the text of the book is just the replication of those questions and those answers. So that it's a more, and, and it's extremely telling of like who he is and his process and how he thinks and how he works. Um, but it was a way to get around like this tr traditional relationship to, to text. Um, David's Taylor, David Taylor's book, which we published about four years ago, and I think many of you here may be familiar with. Um, this is a project where the process for this book um, was a little bit unlike most other projects we had worked on. Um, David was about midway through this project photographing along um, the US-Mexico border. Um, and I think it was a project that was really ready for publication, but he wasn't completely finished with the project. He's now completely finished the project, and we're talking about another publication that documents all 272 monuments along the US-Mexico border. But at the time, we were dealing with both the images that he had taken documenting the border itself, as well as the images documenting the border monuments that are along the border. So it's sort of like two different groups of images. And David came to us and made the proposal to do the book project and literally had thousands of images. I mean, he had taken all of the images of the monuments, but he had also taken all of these other images in and around the process of documenting the monuments themselves. And so he came up to Santa Fe and we actually um, rented a warehouse space, a big, rare, big raw warehouse space in Santa Fe, because I really wanted the space to think about all these images and try to think about how we could put them together in some sort of object. At the time, we really didn't know what the book would be, whether the book would segment the monument images from the sort of what I ended up calling more process images, because he was really, he began the project with this idea of documenting in a very documentary photography vein all of the monuments along the border. But what happened is, in addition to taking those images, he ended up photographing everything that was happening around him. So really almost two different kinds of images. So we, we laid them all out. We spent about three days going through this process of laying out prints, thinking about prints, thinking about sequence, thinking about what worked together. Um, and I think it was part of this process of these really long, long, you know, this warehouse space was, you know, 80, 90 feet long, and we laid out all these long rolls of white paper and just started playing. That ultimately led to the idea of, of segmenting the book into really two parts. Um, one part being this long accordion fold. Um, and the accordion fold has the images of the monuments themselves. And they're in sequential order as they run from Texas to the border of California front and back of this accordion fold. So literally playing with this idea of the border as a line, and then the entire accordion fold sort of pulls out into this 30 foot long object that sort of replicates the border. Um, and then we did, the book in front here is actually a hardbound book that includes all of the other images of what was happening around him. And both of those objects then sit in the slipcase, which is on the far right of that image. And then typographically playing with this idea that the title of the book, which he always had the title of the book, Working the Line, um, playing with this idea of one of the books we started to refer to as working, and the other one we started to refer to as the line. So typographically, you can see that the slipcase has both of those um, reversed out of the image, and then the, the main book has just working, and then the line is varnish only, so it's sort of there but ghosted, and then the reverse on the on the cover of the accordion fold so that you can begin to play with like determining which element is which by the way that the typography is played on the covers. Uh, the Auckland project um, is a, a project that we were actually commissioned to do. So the museum in Auckland, New Zealand um, asked Alex Soth 
and John Gossage to come to New Zealand and photograph for three weeks and do an exhibition at the museum based on the work that they took. And at the same time, we were asked to then take the results of what they did and make a book or two books of the work that they created um, that could accompany the exhibition. So, um, and John and Alex are from pretty different generations, have kind of a different approach um, to their work and uh, went off to, to New Zealand to, to take the images. Um, and about the time they were done, um, they called when they got back and John was extremely excited and said he had 350 to 400 images and he couldn't wait to start working on the book. And Alec called and said he got one good image. Um, so it was one of those moments where you think, yeah, I don't know exactly how we're gonna make a book out of one image. Um, and, it, and it turned um, into a really good um, challenge and a good problem. Um, John's, John's project was inspired by this, it's on the cover of this book, this is the cover of his portion of the book. So the, the two books that we made ended up being housed in this case. This is um, a plastic sort of case um, that from a design standpoint is meant to reference um, sun. I asked both of them what they remembered most from being in New Zealand and they both, independent of each other, said they both remembered the quality of the light and the sunlight. And when I asked them what color they remembered, they both said yellow. It's really kind of quite fascinating how quickly they both responded that way. Um, so the, the case of the book was sort of inspired by that concept. And um, so John's book is a pretty traditional book. It shows the work. Um, it has sort of a, a, a quirky John Gossage kind of quality to the way that it's put together. It was inspired by this little book that he found on um, Southern Stars that the book itself uh, spins as you know it's you're supposed to spin it as you look at it and look at it from different perspectives so inside this book there are gatefolds that are oriented different ways and so you spin the book to look at it in different directions um, and then for Alec um, his quote-unquote book is actually a portfolio and inside the portfolio there's a pocket and inside the port the pocket is this poster um, so uh, on one side of the fold out of the poster is the one image that um, he got and took, but it's at a 30 by 40 size, so it's this very large um, image. And on the other side, he and I worked together to think about um, what could be done on the other side. And he had, at the time, been starting and, and, and since then, I think, has continued to, to work and play with this idea of telling these narrative stories in his own handwriting. And so on the opposite side of the, of the large image is his story of how he came to take this image, what it was like to be in New Zealand, working with John, how he had technical problems, how he tried to take this image. Anyway, it tells the full narrative of how he came across this object. Um, another, another book with a painter, Rudolf de Krenis is a Swiss painter um, who died about five years ago. Um, we did this project right after Rudy died. Um, Rudy's paintings are um, remarkable, extremely minimal, um, he was known for creating these paintings that um, he would do an exhibition for a museum and you would walk into the space and, and on first blush think that you were walking into a room of eight gray paintings. Um, but the work is very much a meditation on ways of looking and ways of thinking. So if you spend, you know, 10, mi 10 minutes in the space, five minutes in the space, you can look around at all these paintings and point to each one of them and say red, yellow, blue, Green. The underpainting under each painting is so different that as time evolves and you're allowed to sort of adjust to looking at them, you can look at them a lot more critically and they, they sort of begin to shift color. And so that was sort of the whole philosophy behind his work. And so trying to come up with a way to do a cover for Rudy's book um, was trying to reference that same concept of like critical, subtle seeing. So the, the cover of the book, the jacket of the book is vellum and all the typography is in the color of gray that he used to use for the surface of his paintings, for his gray paintings. And then behind, on the back of the sheet of vellum, each of the name and the front and back cover have back printed solid color. So that actually when you look at the cover over a period of time, they begin to sort of glow from a certain color because you get this sort of resonance off the back of the typography on the front. Um, there was a lot to play with with Rudy's work. Rudy also, um, he, he, one of the paintings that he worked on when he was still alive, the paintings would have 40, 50 coats of color on them. 
um, and he would photograph and document every layer of paint he put on every painting and and essentially in this very Swiss way he would write down the direction that the paint was applied the time of day that the paint was applied the color that was applied and so we were able to go back through his archives and find photographs of one painting that he did this for the entire thing and there's a booklet bound inside the book that shows the raw canvas through every single day that he applied paint to it until the final piece so you can actually see and it documents what color, what kind, and what direction the paint was applied. Um, this is a new book. Um, this book is also here. This is um, a project with a photographer named Victoria Sambonaris, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, Vicky is known um, as, as a landscape painter. The work is, uh, I mean, a landscape photographer. The work is very, um, thoughtful and very studied, but it's also really quite beautiful. And I think a lot of people respond to her work for the beauty of the work as opposed to sort of the, a lot of the content behind it. Um, so, and this book was brought to us as a retrospective of her work. So the main part of the book is a retrospective in, in some ways somewhat traditional book that shows the images in sequence, chronological sequence. Um, but I really felt strongly that we wanted to sort of add more complexity to the understanding of her work. So in the back of the book, there's a pocket. And um, inside the pocket are three elements. Um, one is a, is a short story by Barry Lopez. Um, this is a case where Vicky, w Vicky and I were talking about her work, and she was talking about some of the inspiration of her work. And Vicky is, um, Vicky teaches at Yale and is, you know, very, fits that mold in some ways, but in some ways completely doesn't. And she's kind of this kick-ass, like independent. She gets in her car and she spends probably six to seven months of every year completely alone, driving across the American landscape, doing her thing. And she carries a Bowie knife stuck in her cowboy boot. And you know, it's this sort of dual kind of thing that goes on with her. But when I started talking about text content and we started talking about this idea of commissioning somebody to write, it was really hard to think about somebody who could encapsulate that or understand it. She said, you know, I was driving one time and I heard on NPR this incredible short story that was read by the guy who wrote it, but I kind of caught it after the beginning, so I don't really know who wrote the short story, but it was about this guy who was a map maker, and it just had so much to say about the way I think about my work. And so we actually did the research and found through going to NPR, NPR's archives and asking about, was there a short story read by an author about a map maker, and found out that it was this short story written by Barry Lopez who's now, you know, from the time he did it at NPR until now, he's become much more well-known as a writer. Um, but we managed to track him down and write to Barry and ask him if we could reproduce the short story. So that first little piece in the pocket, which you can see a little bit better here, is the recreation of that short story. And then she takes Polaroids because she shoots large format, format 8x10, and so she uses Polaroids as part of her process. And I really wanted to show some of those because they talk a lot about how she does her work and how she thinks about her work. And so this is a fold out of um, a photograph, actually, of a bunch of Polaroids that we post that we pinned up to the wall and then photographs so that you get this sort of sense of a collage of them. And then tucked underneath, still in the pocket in this image, is a booklet that's separately bound and shows all of the stuff that she plays with and t carries and is gifted. She has a rock collection, she keeps journals. So we took all of these elements that she are part of the sort of process that she thinks about and we brought them all to the studio in Santa Fe. We put a white shelf on the wall and we laid them all against the wall and we photographed them all ourselves. And then this book is just, the whole thing is just a white wall that runs from edge to edge of the pages and it just shows all these objects one after another as sort of part of the you know, process that she works with. This is a new book, it's not published yet, um, on Jason Rhodes' work. Jason Rhodes um, did a, a piece called P. Row Foam um, that was um, one of, at least to me, one of the most remarkable pieces that he made. Um, it was, uh, if you're not that familiar with Jason's work, it was sort of this um, performance slash installation slash um, conceptual piece where he mixed together that white vermiculite um, foam with peas and salmon roe. So that's where the pea roe foam name comes from. 
with clear glue and he would package these elements in refabricated ivory snow boxes, ship them to the location, and then take these um, objects and create these sort of interventions with this material. Um, these are installation shots of a recreation of part of that installation at David Werner. Um, in this image, you can see um, that image on the far right is sort of a sculpture made from Piro foam. Um, but part of it, part of the idea of the book was to try to come up with something that would reference, you know, an artist who's no longer alive. We're dealing with the estate. We're trying to be respectful and understand what could happen. Um, but ultimately decided that we would take a reproduction of this ivory snow box, which is what he had sort of, you know, taken to be part of the piece. And this is actually the box that holds the book. So you have to open the ivory snow box to find the book inside it. That's actually an image of Marilyn Chambers, um, who went on to become a really famous porn star, but she did this um, Ivory Snow you know, commercial before then, and I, they, the, the company ended up pulling all these boxes when she did her first porn movie because they didn't want to be associated with it anymore. Um, but this sort of shows the, the, bo the box is actually perforated, so you perf the, the front of it and the, and the book comes out the front. Not, necess not necessarily. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think I alluded to this before, but I think for me as a designer, the philosophy has to be that it comes from the work. Yeah. So this is a case where the work came in a box like that. It makes sense that the book come in a box like that. You know, there's a, there's a rationale behind thinking about it. It's fun, it's engaging, it's interesting, but it's also like pulled from the work itself. And so it, there has to be that kind of relationship for me to want to try something like that I, I and and yeah I mean we've done other things we've done other boxes we've done other books we also do um, limited edition versions of some of these books where we're really going kind of beyond in terms of thinking about casing the book and a print or a piece of art or something in some sort of container so that they can be these interesting sort of engaged objects and those are usually you know, elements that we do in additions of like 10 or five or, you know, really small runs. Like the so that book is going to be, I think, 2,500 copies. But it's, it's a, you know, I mean, it's a fabricated cardboard box. It's not, it's not a, it's a, it's a very viable thing to produce yeah. from a mass perspective. Um, and this is a book that um, actually is going to launch tomorrow night in Chicago with the Art Institute. John Gossage, the same photographer I was talking about with the Auckland Project. This is John's new book. Um, John uh, has, for the last three or four years, been photographing in Italy. And this is a set of three books that document all of those images of Italy. Um, the project is called Pomodori Agrapolo, which is Italian for a cluster of tomatoes. It's also in Italian a sort of euphemism for things that hold together well or hang together well and so you would refer to um, you know a, something that works together well a group of people that work together well a, you know a, a meal that hangs together well you would refer to it as a as a you know pomodoro agrapolo and so this is this so we took this idea of a cluster of things and and separated three sort of distinct chapters of the book into actually three separate books so there's three separate books each book has a different piece of text. Um, Marlene Klein is a um, writer that um, is American, but she's been teaching at the Institute of, at the University in Venice for 30 years and has this really interesting relationship um, to words and to poetry. And so she ended up writing um, two stories and an epilogue. And they're very short and they're kind of unrelated to John's work, but they add a really interesting sort of feel of what it's like to sort of think about these images and about being in Italy and um, it's interesting. And those are inserted on a different kind of paper inside the book. Um, but so the three books, um, the three books actually are three different trim sizes, but the image trim in each book is exactly the same. So the books are meant to be a little bit of a, an understanding of what it's like to see different trimmed images in, this, in different trimmed sizes of the book. And they do feel different. Um, it's kind of a fun, 
way to think about when you're thinking about your own book, this idea of what, what the image size feels like on the scale of a page. And, the, and the, the books aren't that different in size, but it is remarkable how different they feel when you look through them. Um, and then in this case, we did do a sort of bigger edition of a quote unquote limited. Um, John really likes this idea of playing around with um, perception and like kind of screwing with people <laughs> in an intentional kind of way. And so he was talking about when we were working on the project, this idea that he likes his books sort of more like thrown out on a coffee table or on a table and the way that they kind of casually feel. So this limited edition has magnets embedded in the covers so that it forces these three books to sit in this orientation. So that they're, and, and he called it the disorderly edition as opposed to the orderly edition. So you can, you know, the regular edition is just three books that you can put on your bookshelf in an orderly way. These books are kind of, fight you. They don't allow you to really do that. So um, I also brought the dummy that we made in our studio to figure out how those go together. And so there's the raw board dummy of these three books that we embedded the magnets in to try to figure out how you put enough magnets in an object to make them lock into that position and sort of um, skew um, intentionally. Um, and that's what I brought. <laughs>